Today on Indie Thinker, I'm taking you to the dojo and I'm going to show you how to fight Musk DeSantis style. And you'll learn how to defend against sexual groomers in elementary school and how to attack the cancellation of free speech. We'll talk about all that and more on today's show. You're about to make the jump from the echo chamber into free and independent thought on the subjects of culture, causes, politics, and faith. Hey, welcome to the show today. Thanks so much for watching or listening wherever you're enjoying this content. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Sharing is caring, and if you truly love your neighbor, you will do to them what you would want done for you, which is you want people to share great stuff, great content with you whenever, whenever they can, so do that with them. So share this show with them, and you will be blessed for doing so. And then extra special favor upon you if you give a five-star review either on Spotify or Apple or, Apple or wherever you're enjoying this content. So make sure to do that. And now, uh, before I jump into the show today, um, I have something to tell you, but then also a quick story. So I want to make sure that you know that I've got Dr. James freaking Lindsay, James freaking Lindsay coming on the podcast this Sunday. So our guest shows are always on Sunday, 8 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we talk about a bunch of things. It will be eye-opening to you to hear him even talk about scripture and to talk about God because he's a he's a, a avowed atheist. And, and, and he talks about all those things because he understands that we all have a common a common threat, if you will, a common enemy right now that we need to stand up against. And, and even though he is ideologically opposed to me in, in many ways with my faith, there, there is something that brings us together, rational, logical truth that right now is, is under fire in America um, from, from institutions and from ideological agendas. And so we, we really put, I think, probably the, in the best way that I've heard, I know that sounds self-serving, but in the best way that I've heard, we put a fine point on the threat that is facing America right now and then give some marching orders as to how we can effectively and responsibly address that threat. So you definitely want to check that out. That's this Sunday. Um, James Lindsay, come on, man. Now, I have a story to share with you. Some of you may think it's funny if you have a twisted sense of, like, kind of Looney Tunes sense of humor. You may think this is funny, but I was crossing the road the other day with my two boys. I had my youngest son in my right hand and my oldest son in my left hand, who is uh, about to turn eight. And so we were crossing the street and uh, he jerked away right as we were getting onto the other side of the street. He jerked away his hand. He pulled it away from my hand and I grabbed it hard because I was like, dude, we, we don't play when we're crossing the street. But I didn't notice that the reason he was jerking his hand away is that he was headed directly for a pole. And so when I grabbed his hand, it actually made him like hit the pole. Now he wasn't hurt too badly. Now again, shame on you for thinking that's funny if you do think that's funny. But he wasn't hurt too badly, but but I thought that it kind of serves as a great analogy for what we're going to be talking about today. There are times where parents make mistakes. It's undeniable. All of us are truly in kind of like the grind that have kids, that is, are truly in the grind of trying to figure out how to be a parent and how to be an effective one and how to make as little mistakes as possible. And all of us are kind of like on the job training with this thing. There's tons of books out there that, sure, read them. But at the end of the day, most of the time, you're just going to be relegated to kind of figuring it out as you go. And you just hope you're doing a good job. And the older you get, the more you realize your parents had no idea what they were doing. However, we'll see today, and I'll, I will argue and defend something that shouldn't even need to be defended, that parents are the ones who are best suited to try to figure out when to let go of their kids' hands. That it is parents who know the birthdays of their kids, who know their kids' names, who know their kids' favorite color, who were there to wipe their butts and to wipe those snotty noses and to take care of them when they were sick. It's, it's their job to take care of those kids, not the state. So yeah, I may have held on to that hand a little bit too long and it might have ended up temporarily in a very minor way hurting my son, but in the long run, the person who is best suited to know what is best for my kid is me, nobody else. Parents have the right to make some of those decisions. So we'll jump in to that front and to the attack on parenthood, quite frankly, here in just a moment. But before we do that, we wanna make sure you know that this episode is sponsored by our friends over at Element Funding. Now, every single show that we do right now is sponsored by these, these fantastic people over at Element Funding. And you would think to yourself, well, maybe we're tired of hearing yet another advertisement. However, uh, 
you don't need to be too tired about this one. If you have not secured your family's future, rate hikes are already happening and will continue to happen. About two more are promised before the end of the year. So now is the time to act. I know some of you thought, we're just going to wait it out and we're going to wait for that bubble to, to, to pop and all of a sudden the housing market's going to be just tons of houses and the prices are going to drop dramatically and we're going to be able to capitalize. And all of you foolish people who are rushing for houses during the pandemic, you're the ones who are going to have to pay for it and we're going to be the smart ones. You're slowly finding out that there is no bottom to the Joe Biden administration and things are only going to get worse. Again, rates are already higher than they were by about two points um, just at the end of last year and rates are going up. So you need to go to our friends over at the Kevin Blair team at Element Funding and go get pre-approved for a home loan today. So go to kevinblairteam.com and see what those guys can do to help you with your mortgage needs. You guys remember Tom Green? The, uh, the Tom Green show, I think is what it was called, it was back on MTV or something like way back in the day. Tom Green is, he's a funny dude. He's a little bit out of the public eye at this time, but I've enjoyed his brand of comedy, maybe you did, I don't know. But he recently posted this on TikTok in a response to the outpouring of attention given to that Will Smith slap at the Oscars. And I, I wanted to see that, I wanted you guys to see that because it serves as a great kind of launching point for what we're gonna be talking about today. So here's that. Love you guys, my name's Tom Green. I know Will Smith just slapped Chris Rock in the face, but that doesn't mean that we have to feel all upset about it. Live your life, man. Stop worrying about shit that doesn't affect you. So I want to be charitable here. Tom Green is right in a very, very small, teeny tiny sliver of a point kind of way. It is possible to be distracted by things that don't matter. And we can focus on what George McDonald said. That need, which is no need at all, can become a demon sucking thing at the spring of your life. So yes, we can focus on things that just take away from us and don't really add. However, seems a little naive at best, and I hear this a lot, to suggest that two famous people getting into it on the biggest live awards TV show on the planet is somehow no big deal. It seems a little dishonest to me, I'm sorry. It seems like you're just trying to find a way to be better than everybody else, and you're trying to prove it by saying, oh, well, I don't pay attention to that stuff like you people do. So more importantly, recognizing the ease with which we can criticize people probably needs to have some attention paid to it as well. The point is, is open dialogue, discussing things, even seemingly insignificant things can help us think more clearly. So we should discuss these things. And I want to full stop right there. Think more clearly. Like, could we use a little bit more of that? That is useful in and of itself. So if you can find something that helps you think more clearly, do it. But mainly it's important because talking about bad behavior can keep it from happening and talking about good behavior can help you Repeat that behavior so that you can do it over and over and over again and make our world hopefully a better place. But none of that happens if we just shut down conversation and say, don't talk about these things. So while the supposed slap heard around the world may not be of the utmost importance, it is important to discuss things going on in our world that may not directly affect us, especially when we're clearly being lied to. The, prote the Parental Protection Act in Florida is becoming the most talked about issue in recent memory and with good cause. The Democrat state-run media has wrongfully dubbed it the Don't Say Gay Bill. Now you may ask yourself why. Well, because they intentionally lie to people and that lie can be perpetuated through the media. That's why they do it. So here's Jen Psaki continuing this lie when asked by Peter Ducey of Fox News if the White House believes that kindergartners should be learning about sexual orientation and gender identity. And so if you guys oppose this law that bans classroom instruction about, about sexual orientation and gender identity in K through three, does the White House support that kind of classroom instruction before kindergarten? Do you have examples of schools in uh, Florida that are teaching kindergartners about sex education? I'm just asking for the president. Well, I think that's a I think that's a relevant question because I think this is a politically charged, uh, harsh law that is putting parents and LGBTQ plus kids in a very difficult. Uh, a heartbreaking uh, circumstance. And so I actually think that's a pretty relevant question. Now, thank God somebody asked this question. Somebody needed to ask it to really put these people into the place of having to answer for the resistance to this bill. Now, I do have to side note though, and just say every time I hear Saki respond to people who disagree with her, I, it's like being in an eighth grade debate class. First of all, 
The woman refuses to actually state a position when opposed. She rather than, secondly, jumps over to talking about how people feel, whether than whether or not the thing is true or should be done. And then third, she totally contradicts herself by claiming on the one hand that kids need the freedom to learn these things in their classrooms. And then, and, and by the way, learn these things, the insanity of transgenderism, kindergartners really need to learn that, even third graders. On the other hand, she wants to say, well, it's a constitutional right, but it's not happening in schools anyway. So it's enough to drive you totally insane when you pull back the curtain and you realize that in Oz, the people that are actually pulling the levers of our institutions are basically eighth grade debaters, uh, or worse. But let's put that last assertion to the test. This is not happening in schools. So that's what she says. That's what she tells Peter Ducey. Show me one school in Florida where this is happening. This is repeated a lot, repeated a lot. So here's some proof. I'm going to share one of my missteps. Um, when I started my first year teaching with the health and wellness team, I had been given a title to a book, so I went to our school library to pull it. And I pulled it thinking I had the right one. I didn't. Um, and I read through, I'm like, this is really progressive stuff. But it was my first year, so I'm like, OK, we're just super progressive. So I went in there guns blazing, and I just went for it. And I ended up talking about the vulva and the labia with pre cares And it was just one of those moments. Everybody's looking in horror. And I'm like, oh, no, I made a really big mistake. And I share that with you because it's not perfect, right? It's a practice. So be kind to yourselves when you're, like, delving into this. Now, in fairness, I don't know if this happened in Florida, but it doesn't really matter. It's proof that it is happening. And now, just to be a little bit more charitable, this woman doesn't know she's being recorded, and she didn't know that we would know that she did this. Thank God she was. And just so you know, she was joking about a mistake that she made. But notice what she said in the joke. Well, I just thought that we were a progressive school. So the dirty little secret here is that there are two kinds of parents on this issue. Those who believe that it is absolutely normal to talk about transgenderism, and those that don't. Those who believe kids are useful tools and those who wish to honor and protect the innocence of kids. Those who believe strangers have no business discussing things with kids, and that only parents should do the discussing. Sure, more discussion is necessary on a multitude of topics, but this is a case where we definitely need to discuss and definitely need to insert some opinions here. So the whole point is, is this. At a time when lies flow like water, it's undeniable that more discussion and more action is in order. Don't allow the critic to keep you silent when they tell you, why are you paying attention to these things? Oh, that's not really happening. Or this one, I love it. Uh, that doesn't matter. Or why be against this thing? Just be positive. That's like the Christian response. Just focus on the positive, as if these things don't exist. Teddy Roosevelt said this about people in his Man in the Arena poem. So he went on to say this, there are many men who feel like kind of twisted pride and cynicism. There are many who confine themselves, and this is the key, to criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. So in other words, uh, you're actually the fool if you listen to the critic, because the critic is just merely somebody who's not doing something themselves and trying to excuse their own inactivity away. That's what criticism really is. They're trying to make you look dumb because they themselves won't do something, and it makes them feel better. So dive into the culture war, even if you make a mistake, even if you put your foot in your mouth. You can learn from mistakes, and even if you fail, it's better to fail trying than to never try at all. As lies proliferate in our society, it becomes more and more important to see what's behind these lies and why such powerful forces wish to enforce them. We'll talk about that today in our headlines. So Disney plans to fight the don't say gay bill, and of course, dubbed that by the media. So according to Yahoo Finance, Disney is actively subverting the will of democratically elected officials in Florida. And now they plan to fight the Florida bill, which is ironic because Democrats desperately want you to think they're the party of the poor and the oppressed. Which if you can't see through that, that what they're actually doing is they wish to oppress people, make them poor, and then to control them. So in that way, yes, they are the party of the oppressed and the poor. But nonetheless, right now, they're cheering along as one of the biggest companies on earth tries to trample on and subvert the democratic process. Now, may I remind you that this is a family entertainment company getting politically involved in subverting laws in Florida. And by the way, 
that company also is from California. So California can't legislate its mor morality or lack thereof in a state and local government thousands of miles away. Why are they doing it? Just simply because they're powerful. Guys, no absolute <laughs> double standard here at all. It's almost as if these people are total hypocrites and they really just want to win at all costs and damn the truth if it helps my ideological goals. But since we know leftists love the truth about like babies in the womb and male and female gender and biological realities that accompany those things, we know they love the truth about that. But if we shelve that just for a moment, let's tackle what Disney is actually doing to fight this bill. So first of all, Bob Chapik, who is the CEO right now, is speaking out against it in employee settings. Uh, a lot of people are saying that's too little too late because they wish to twist the arm of these companies to do their bidding. Um, and he's going one step further and he's creating a task force that, his, that was mandated by Chapek to make more LGBTQ content for kids in the future. Now, if the shoe was on the other foot, I'd say, don't like Disney, don't watch. Don't like what Disney is, a, is about, don't support them. Don't go to their theme parks. And fair enough, if there weren't other forces at play here. So here's what Yahoo Finance had to say about all of this and why Disney is really even behind this kind of stuff, or at least what is happening in, 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 in the employee base of Disney that is causing this stuff to happen. So watch this clip. So yesterday's strong public stance, a step in the right direction. Disney has also unveiled a new task force that will, quote, develop action plans to make more LGBT aware content for children and family. Chapik and other senior leaders also are set to conduct a global listening tour to meet with employees. So as we were saying, really a complete 180 from where we were a month ago. Ali, uh, of course, there are other workers right now fighting big corporations. Uh, how does that help or, or hurt what's happening at Disney? Yeah, there's really a big call to action right now when it comes to corporations having a responsibility that extends beyond their core businesses. We've seen Starbucks workers fighting to unionize. We just got news today that Condé Nast workers also want to unionize. It wasn't that long ago that we saw Netflix employees stage their own public walkouts in response to Dave Chappelle's controversial comedy special. There's been instances at Amazon, Kellogg's. This is really happening all over and it's created a ripple effect, I think, throughout all of these companies. I spoke with the president of one of the unions out in California that represents several worker classifications within Disney. He said that members expect Disney to be a good corporate citizen, that workers are now realizing that they have more power than they think, and it's long overdue that they hold these employers accountable. So really, to put it bluntly, we are in the midst of a workers' revolution. Did she just say what I think she just said? Let's roll the tape back and listen. Really, to put it bluntly, we are in the midst of a workers' revolution. Okay, yeah, she said it. Workers' revolution. Now, where have we heard that before? A workers' revolution. Is it possible that the radical LGBTQ agenda is actually really just a form of Marxism? Funny you should ask. So a guy named Antonio Gramsci is the father of cultural Marxism, and he viewed education as an essential tool for the proliferation of communism into the mainstream, which is why, by the way, um, he was writing. He was trying to say, hey, this is how the communist rev revolution is going to take place. It's not going to take place through an act of fighting revolution. It's going to take place through essentially through a culture war. But he wasn't alone in this assertion. Acting as the education coordinator, guys, in 1919, Greg Lukes lived in Hungarian Soviet Republic and installed a sexual promiscuity education for children at the elementary school level. Hello, a true Leninist and devout Marxist, this guy premised his policy on the need to destroy the family structured on the existential bonds that derive from that bond. So flagrant sexuality, unchecked by parents, morality or religion was a useful mode of forming communism's new man. So what am I trying to say? Listen, I know not everybody behind the LGBTQIA plus agenda is a Marxist or everybody that's just littering their Twitter feed with the word gay right now is a Marxist. But I am going to tell you, there are people in America who truly believe that the family bonds or the destruction of the nuclear family, maybe you've heard that before, is, is a good thing. 
because those bonds are going to be an impediment to the Marxist revolution that very dishonest and evil people wish to bring upon America. So there are people who posited years and years and years ago that one of the greatest ways that you can bring about this revolution is by starting with a new generation of kids in elementary school and you teach them aberrant sexual ideologies that help strip them away from their parents' teaching and help strip them away from common knowledge and what we all know to be biological realities. If you can convince a new generation of those things and you start in elementary school, then slowly but surely you can enforce the revolution that we Marxists have been after for a long time. Now, so here's the big question because I know what people are thinking already as they hear this. The big question is this, Reed, are these people really Marxist? That's not the big question. The big question is this, Am I a fool for suggesting that Marxism may be behind this, or is the person that is willing to totally disregard tens of, of maybe even close to hundreds of years of writing and history being written about this very subject, am I the fool for ignoring all of that and pretending as though it doesn't exist? We should not be, by any objective standard, be teaching children in kindergarten through third grade and beyond these radical sexual ideologies. I'm gonna go one step further, and I know people will disagree with this, but I don't even think sex, edu sex education should be taught in school, period. That the only reason that happened is because in the 60s, the feminist movement and other movements like it tried to impose that kind of teaching in the school system to impose its radical agenda. It's undeniable, this is a historical fact. And now, trickling down through the ages, we've come to accept it as normal. But it wasn't normal. It has only been around since the 60s. And I just happen to think that the person best suited to be able to instruct our kids in these things is parents, strangers. When we don't know their ideological bends, when we don't know their true motivations, should not be sticking to anything other than objective sciences. So yeah, maybe teach body parts, but stay away from safe sex and stay away from teenage promiscuity. That's not your role. Stay in your lane. Teach reading, teach math, teach biological realities. Do not teach aberrant sexual orientation or uh, gender preferences, as though that was a thing. So this is where I get up in arms and I say, forgive me if I don't wanna stick my head in the sand or realize that there is an ideological agenda behind all of these ideas, but hey, you do you. If you wanna go live in the Soviet Republic of California, go for it. But don't think for a second that you're gonna impose your non-federalist will upon the people of Florida. So if you think you're gonna turn Florida into California without a fight, you got another thing coming because you got the wrong governor in there for that. That's why people wanna alienate this guy because he's just, he's not having it. And when you encroach upon the devil's territory, trust me, those demons begin to scream. And here's some of that screaming right here in this next headline. So a second grader has more common sense than Ron DeSantis, according to the Daily Beast. Of course, this Daily Beast, the place for all insane leftist journalism. So apparently, uh, he's not the only one uh, that is insane because the writer of this article apparently hasn't even read the bill, which by the way, this used to be what reporters did. I, I'll never get tired of trying to like wake people up to this reality because there are people who still watch CNN and MSNBC for crying out loud. I don't get it. And sure, throw Fox in the mix, but, but think for yourself for crying out loud. You know, journalists used to actually write from an informed perspective and not just by opinion. But now apparently all you need is a degree in gender studies to write for the Daily Beast and a sheer lack of common sense. Because the bill does not forbid children to talk about their families. This is so nauseatingly stupid, but of course this is what this writer suggests. And here's a quote from an eight-year-old. Yeah, that's right, we're taking our cues from eight-year-olds. This report goes on to say, this eight-year-old, Sawyer, offered his considered opinion of the legislation that Governor Ron DeSantis has since he signed the law. Quote, it's stupid, he said. Quote, it needs to go away because people might feel left out and might feel really sad and stuff. Everybody should be able to love everybody and be able to talk about it in school, close quote. So put aside the fact that we're taking our cues from an eight-year-old, the bill does not forbid children to talk about their families or to talk about what they did that weekend or to say, hey, my two moms or anything like that. That's not what the bill does. This is so nauseatingly stupid, it's almost foolish to talk about. The bill forbids classroom instruction on gender and sexual orientation. So that means teachers cannot teach lessons on the subject of being gay or straight to a third grader. Now, I just heard this the other day, by the way, from 
uh, from a teacher who was talking about this bill, and he was talking about how he had rainbow flags and all these other things and all this gray, gay propaganda around his classroom and how uh, the conversation just happened to come up in classroom about who he was. And they said, instead of teaching social studies to fifth graders, he had a 45 minute discussion about his sexual preference to a bunch of fifth graders. So bro, just stick to your job, man. You are not being paid to, to talk to these kids about this, much less, like, are we really supposed to believe that they are just, just happen to be asking the question because it's just accidentally, there's rainbows all over the whole classroom and the kids wanna know why, and that you just happen to, uh, to do that because that's the way you like to decorate your classroom. When of course we all know the opposite would cause the left to just absolutely throw up projectile vomit from their mouth like in The Exorcist and get rid of all those demons inside of them if a teacher once had Christian propaganda in his classroom and said, hey, you need to repent and accept Jesus. If those posters were all over the classroom, what do you think the left would do about that? So of course, this guy is purposefully trying to propagandize these children with the things in his classroom. But yet again, the whole point is that this bill is not about not saying gay or kids not being able to share what's going on in their own personal lives. It's about curriculum that should be based upon reading, math, and science, not sexual preference and, and orientation. So based upon the reaction to this bill, if the right was just as dishonest as the left, they could stand up in arms and say, we can't talk about heterosexuality in our classroom because it actually forbids even that. We're not going to talk about kindergartners through third grade about sex. We're just gonna, we're just not going to do that, which seems like a pretty fair ask to me because these are young kids. And then beyond that, have age appropriate conversations. That's the heart of this bill. It doesn't discriminate against LGBTQIA plus blah, 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 nothing. It says classroom instruction will be limited to things not relegated to sex when you're a kindergartner which any sane person can agree to, and most do when they actually read the bill. So here's the thing that the left doesn't want you to know, and even if you look this up on a Google search, what you'll find is a bunch of LGBTQ activists who are going to lie to you about the polls, but the polls actually say this. More than 52% of Democrat voters in Florida support the so-called don't say gay bill that bans the teaching of sexual orientation and gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. Now this poll goes on to say this, that 52% of Democrats surveyed um, do not oppose this bill. A further 12% remarked that they were unsure of their stance on the bill. So let me interpret that for you. This is another 12% that is in favor of this supposed don't say gay bill, but are too spineless to say that openly. So only 36% of those polled said they opposed the legislation officially called the parental rights in education bill. And you can look this up for yourself. You can go and the polls were taken when people actually read the bill and then ask, do you oppose this legislation? The numbers bump up by about 10% with those on the left. So Democrats even in above 60% said, no, in Florida, Democrats in Florida said, no, we don't oppose this bill when they're actually told what the bill actually says. So no, the vast majority of Americans are not behind this radical, this radical uh, cancellation of this bill. So again, we've heard arguments. This isn't happening. Oh yeah, then why do you care so much? And then we've heard this. Uh, this is the civil rights issue of our day. Now, this is where I have to stop for a moment. And I just, I wish black people would stand up and say something about this nonsense. Uh, where you put your genitals is a private matter and does not have anything to do with race in America. A long time ago, the activists in the LGBTQ community tried to, quote, hitch their wagon, unquote, to the civil rights movement, and it worked, which means all the hard work that black people have fought for for, for years and years and years have now been appropriated by a 17-year-old white girl with green hair looking to rebel against her parents. It's nonsense, guys. And if that doesn't illustrate it for you, I don't know what will. And therefore, we need to talk about it, but we do, and people are right to say this, we do need to go one step further. And we need to do something about it. Because we don't just need to tear down culture, we need to, we need to build culture. Or we don't need to just critique culture or criticize culture, we need, we need to create culture. And that is exactly what Elon Musk is doing. So multiple news outlets reporting that Elon Musk has become a majority stakeholder in Twitter. Now guys, this is totally insane. I don't have much to say about this other than to say that Elon Musk 
who was just recently asked on the Babylon B if he was willing to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I absolutely love those guys. He is actually showing Christians and anybody with a good conscience, any decent human being, what we need to do in light of what is going on in the world. So he saw a problem, and he's been posting about it on Twitter pretty uh, pretty commonly, about the fact that free speech is being canceled on Twitter. And then he took a poll and about 70, more than 70% of people on Twitter said, yes, we don't believe that Twitter is a place that values the, the tenets of free speech. And so Elon Musk, who is a the most wealthy man in the world, or at least one of them, that yeah, kind of fluctuates from time to time, Anyway, he bought a majority share. He's got more share than even uh, Dorsey does. So I think he's got like 9% of uh, the shares of Twitter. Uh, so he is a majority stakeholder in Twitter. And one can only imagine the reason he did that, since we don't really know, is that he means to do something about the image of Twitter and to turn Twitter into a truly useful public forum where people can voice their opinions and their thoughts without feeling like they're being shadow banned or without feeling like they're being canceled for no reason. Speaking of the Babylon Bee, who um, did that interview with Elon Musk, by the way, if you don't know who these guys are by now, where have you been living? Like, follow the Babylon Bee. Fantastic stuff. But nonetheless, the Babylon Bee was just kicked off of Twitter uh, because they did a joke tweet about nominating uh, Rachel Levine, uh, man of the year. So it, I, I don't have time to go into that, but suffice to say, uh, it's clear that Twitter is not a free speech platform or a platform that values free speech. And one can only hope that, that Elon Musk is going to do something about this, but this sh just shows what we should do if we have within our power to do something. Yes, we should go beyond complaining, but by the way, Complaining is usually the label that people give to others because they're not willing to actually step up and do something themselves or they don't value what the other person is saying. But it doesn't mean that, that you're actually just complaining. You might actually be saying something that needs to be heard. Nonetheless, um, so, so keep on talking about those things. But, but, but Elon Musk is doing something right. He is fighting back in a way that makes substantive change. Now, the Daily Wire is doing this probably better than anybody else. When people get canceled, they're hiring those people. When companies refuse to uh, be legitimately concerned with the best interest of their customers, they're creating, they're creating businesses. And when Disney goes out and says, hey, we're not going to uh, we're, we're not going to value what parents want. We're going to make sure that we value a queer agenda for, for children. So guess what Daily Wire is doing now? They're creating children's content. So suffice to say, even if you're right, left, center, or whatever the case may be, the reality is, is that the answer to all of this stuff is the creation of culture, redeemed culture, useful culture. I, I would even say sanctified culture if you're a Christian, that that rivals those things that are happening in the world. We have to have a group of people who are willing to do that. So become a stakeholder. In other words, use whatever power that you have at your disposal to move the needle, even if just, just a tiny bit. I often hear the critique that, that complaining and discussing the issues that I do on my show doesn't actually do anything. And to that I say, change has to start somewhere, guys. It has to start somewhere. And yes, it starts with discussion on substantive issues. You're typically not going to create culture unless you're willing to first discuss the things that are going on. So you got to start somewhere. Don't let people silence you. But I also can't exactly tell you what to do with your life. So that's up to you. So I need to discuss these things. And then hopefully you will take that and then decide what can I do about it. So should you cancel Disney Plus? I think so. But I'm not going to tell you what to do. Everyone has to decide for themselves. But decide you must. And if we together act, we can make a difference. Musk saw a need, the restoration of free speech in the town square. He moved on an opportunity. And now Twitter may actually become a place where free speech is valued again. I mean, just think about that. So you can be a Luddite that wants to smash Twitter and destroy it and probably start your own company, or you can reform it and you can reform it from within. So smash whatever you don't like, you know, feel free but also be a pioneer. And we'll see in our final segment that Christians especially who are pioneering things can truly make a difference. So in our Christianity Not Today segment, we typically dig into 
stuff that doesn't represent Christianity and then stuff that does. So in this case, we've got something that definitely represents Christianity. So my sense of humor, whether you like it or not, is uh, Christianity, not today, uh, son, but this is Christianity today proper. So this is what I, I believe is a great example of what Christians can do to fight back. So at the beginning of the show, when I said the Musk DeSanta style of fighting back, um, wh what I meant is, is that I, I see that there are those who are willing to create a social cost and willing to step out and to really uh, to put their their work or the reputation, their position of power on the line to do something substantive that really makes a difference and that really helps people. This is what DeSantis is doing, this is what Musk is doing, and this is what Sean Foyt is doing. So Sean Foyt is the founder of Hold the Line, but he's also the founder of the Let Us Worship movement. You'll remember that, you know, back during the pandemic, he was in places like Seattle. He even came into my neck of the woods, into Chattanooga, to do these Let Us Worship kind of settings where he would just where he would just worship openly regardless of what, you know, lockdown uh, measures were being put in place. And he got a lot of heat for that because really it's so funny that the kind of left-leaning Christians in our society um, want to be activists for everything until they find a fundamentalist Christian or an evangelical Christian who is an activist. And then they will tell you, you should not be an activist Christian. You should just focus on the Bible. But of course, when it comes to like gender ideology, they don't want to focus on the Bible. But when it comes to like actually preaching the gospel, they don't want to focus on the Bible. They want to, they want to totally pervert and destroy that totally. Um, and, and they want to put like feminist perspectives on everything and black liberation theology perspective on everything instead of just like, well, how about the, like the true perspective on things? Um, the biblical perspective on things. So that, that, that anytime any Christian actually stands up and can make a substantive difference in the world, these guys come quickly to, to criticize. So he got a lot of criticism, and he's probably going to get a lot of criticism for this, but he just planned a protest at Disney's HQ in Burbank, California. So before I dig into it, I want to let you hear from him first about what he's doing and why he planned to do it. So what are you doing today? Tell us about the rally. So, you know, Disney has entertained our kids for decades. We've loved it. I've taken my kids to Disney World. It's been amazing. They've loved the movies, but they crossed a line in the sand when they began to enable those who want to fight to sexualize our kids. So we started a petition at, at fight, uh, parentsfightback.com, parentsfightback.com. We have 20,000 signatures on that petition. And we thought we got to put feet to that petition. And so we're going to gather today in Burbank at the Disney headquarters, 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to have a rally. We're going to let our voice be heard. We're going to let parents. Uh, we have former Disney employees, current Disney employees. Huh. We have people in the industry. And we're just going to take a stand. So it seems pretty clear, right, that he's going to take a stand. He's got a petition that you can sign. And I'll put the link down below in this podcast so that you can go be a part of that, that signing of that petition. And uh, it's pretty clear that he means to take a stand against his stated goal of sexualizing children. Now, this is exactly what is taking place because it would have been obscene when I was in kindergarten to even think that a teacher would talk to us about her own private romantic life, much less curriculum in classrooms that have to do with any type of sexual orientation or gender identity. So it's just insane that we even are having this conversation right now. The only way to fight back against that is with Christian activism. Now, this is the thing I wanted to talk about here, is that usually the word Christian and activist don't go hand in hand. And even I have a little bit of kind of misgivings about the labels because the word activist is so laden with so much baggage that you wonder to yourself, is a Christian really supposed to be an activist? Well, here's what I can tell you. I think a Christian is, is supposed to be active. And I think a Christian is supposed to be vocal. And I believe if a Christian cannot get behind protecting children, then it doesn't actually know what Christianity is. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this, is Christian activism is a form of benevolence. Now, I, I honestly, I don't think that holding a sign or standing out in front of a building per se is loving, but I can tell you this, one of the most unloving things that you can do is to sit silent, silently and dishonestly and do nothing. Now, sure, Let's have a robust conversation about what we should do, what is going to be most beneficial for kids, what we can do to really make a difference for kids, um, and what we can really do to make a difference in our world. Sure, I'm, I'm down with that, but I just know this. 
those forces, and I'm talking about this a lot lately because I see it so often, those forces that wish to silence people are not working in your best interests. So I guess at the end of the day, silence is, is not benevolence. Speaking the truth in love is, is real love. But, but then I would also try to reclaim this for all of us here today, especially those Christians who are watching. Christian activism is a thing. And Christian activism is necessary today if we're truly going to make a difference on issues that matter. And we better stand up for the things that truly do matter. And I can't think of anything that matters more to me than my own kids and the life of these, of these young ones and making sure that the next generation is prepared for. So at the end of the day, I do want to reclaim the, the idea or the term Christian activism. Maybe if you could put another term in it, you could say Protestant Reformationism. I mean, we come from this lineage in the Protestant church, in the evangelical church, that we come from this idea that we can make a difference. We can lift our voice and we can change things. And we've seen it happen in the past. History is a great storyteller. And those stories tell us that if we stand for truth, if we stand for things that truly matter, Christians, if you stand for biblical principles, you can make a difference that ages and generations will be impacted by if you take a stand. There is nothing virtuous about your silence, I guess, in other words. Again, it's way easier to criticize somebody for them being vocal than it is for you to actually figure out what you should be saying. So I can't tell you what to do and what to speak out about. And I know you can't speak out about everything, but there are some things that you should be paying attention to and at least you should decide for yourself what things should you speak about. And then secondly, because from that discussion will come a conviction to act so the discussion has to come first. And then when that conviction to act comes upon you, then you will be fighting Musk DeSantis style. You'll be entering into the dojo and you will finally be able to truly do what you were created for, which is to make a difference for good. Because I think if anything, all of these things that are going on right now, uh, we're seeing left, right, and everything in between, you're either gonna make a difference for good or you're gonna make a difference for evil. There really is no in between in that situation. This is why sometimes I think the center is just a cop out uh, for not will being willing to take a position on things. Not always the case, but very often the case when you say, well, well I'm more in the center. That's because you don't wanna take a position on things. And the reality is, is there is no in between. Karate do or karate don't. You, you, you are either going to make a, a, a harsh and bad impact on the world or a positive impact in the world. Now to do that, you don't have to think like me, but you do have to think for yourself. And then you do have to speak and then you have to act. So I wish you the best on that journey. And we'll talk about what that journey looks like, hopefully in future episodes, but that's all the time we have for today. So thanks so much for liking, sharing, subscribing, and for checking us out today. We'll catch you next time. You can catch brand new episodes of Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman every Monday and weekly bonus episodes to keep you thinking throughout the week. But you have to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new episodes drop. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like this video and share it with friends.